JM on Cars is sponsored by Car Vertical. With just a registration number, or even better, a VIN, Car Vertical will search over 20 European databases to find out whether any car you're looking at has a hidden past. They can see if a vehicle was used as a taxi, stolen, suffered fire damage, or involved in a crash, even when it wasn't written off, so could pass other checks. Car Vertical is now an essential tool in my car buying kit, putting all the information I need to know together in one easy to read report. Even better, if you follow the link in the description down below, you'll get 10% off. A big thank you to them for being today's sponsor. Italy is a country that's often cited as producing some of the most interesting and exciting automobiles in the world. However, if you're like me and you got your driving license in the mid-2000s and you wanted to buy yourself something Italian, the choice wasn't really very good. You'd be struggling to think why it is exactly that people were so obsessed with Alfa Romeo. For quite some time, the lineup really wasn't that exciting at all. You had the meat which is a scratchy, plastic-filled, very unreliable, if somewhat pretty little car. Then the Giulietta came along and was again very, very nice to look at, but awfully cheap inside and chronically unreliable, without a shadow of a doubt one of the most casually broken cars I've ever driven. Even when the 4C appeared on the scene and everyone hoped this was the beginning of a new dawn for Alpha, they didn't quite get that right either. It didn't get particularly good reviews, citing generally unfavourable comparisons with the Lotus products of the time. But then, at long last, in 2015, six years ago now, we finally got to see the car that should have brought Alfa Romeo back. It was called the Giulia, and the one they debuted was the Quadrifoglio. It had all of the ingredients for guaranteed greatness. A very attractive body shell featuring a number of carbon fiber components, carbon bonnet, carbon roof, carbon prop shaft. It also had a fire breathing, 500 horsepower, twin turbocharged V6 engine, which everybody knew was Ferrari derived, but for some reason, lots of people claimed that it wasn't. And it was rear wheel drive. You could even in Europe, get it with a manual gearbox. The car then came out and lo and behold, at long last this was not an Alfa Romeo you needed to make excuses for anymore everybody loved it six years later though and it's just been announced that the Giorgio platform on which this car is based is going to be canned the Giulia will be its one and only fruit but what a harvest it was. Alfa are currently in the middle of making the ludicrously overpriced and little bit silly GTAM. But if you've got about 40,000 pounds burning a hole in your pocket, you could pick yourself up a very nice example of the Quadrifoglio. A few years ago, it looked like about 30 grand would do the job. However, in the last year, car prices in general have gone up, and I think there's very good reasons why these may stay strong for some time yet, especially as there is now not going to be another one. Forty grand, though, is no small amount of money. And although I recently driven a Giulia Veloce, which is a sort of cooking two-liter petrol one, it's been a while since I've got behind the wheel of the full-fat Quadrifoglio. So while I'm up here in Scotland, a lovely chap called Dave offered me a go of his to see if this still has the magic that I remember. This is a 2019, meaning it's a little bit later on than the car that I drove previously. There are actually a few changes of significance. Firstly, this is now a five-seater rather than a four-seater with folding rear seats. Alfa Romeo also introduced port injection in the engine to go alongside the existing direct injection, but it wasn't until 2020 where they actually updated this interior. I do believe in my original video I gave some praise to the interior of the car, and in truth it's it's okay, but really it's nothing more. I think Alfa should and could have done a little bit better, but it's some nice shapes, got a little bit of carbon fibre to lift it, there's a bit of leather, but would have liked some nice materials for the roof liner here, and the whole thing does feel like they have raided the FCA parts bin just a little bit more than they perhaps needed to. Driving around town, this car is very comfortable. I've got it set currently in normal or natural mode, whatever they want to call it on the DNA switch. The car is changing gears quite happily. The steering is nice enough and everything works pretty well. That's with the small exception of the brakes. This car has brake by wire and it's something I never really got on with in the Alphas. Both the original Quadrifoglio I drove and the Veloce I took out recently just doesn't work that well. When you're pressing on, it's okay, but it's when you're around town and you're trying to just pull up to a junction where it, 
it seems unnecessarily difficult. However, this isn't the sort of car that you bought for just bimbling around down to the shops. No, no, you bought it because you wanted to be able to have some serious fun with it. So, can you do that? Well, let's chuck it into dynamic mode and find out. really quite a complicated car this it has so many absolutely fantastic elements to it you can see the carbon bonnet there just sat underneath the painted section the steering is quite quick the car being designed by ex ferrari people it does still have some feel in it but not masses the amazing thing though is how well this car disguises its weight alfa romeo claimed that it was one of the lightest in its class at 1525 kilos and that would have been true if it were true, but it's not. You see, Alpha's scales, they must have borrowed from Lotus and then got even more wrong because this car, in actual fact, is closer to about 1,700 kilos. And that makes it about 75 kilos more than the equivalent F80 generation BMW M3. It's only about 30 kilos less than the new absolute heifer of an M3. The gear shift remains spectacular. These beautiful aluminium paddles are really nice in the hand. The action is very pleasing and the calibration is superb. Both up and down shifts, no problem at all. Every now and again, you get a nice little crack on the upshift, but it's not too much. Not really the sort of typical DSG fart you get in some other cars. What is slightly disappointing though, is the exhaust. Previously, I've said that Alfa Julia's never really sounded that nice. And the truth is, this one doesn't sound like anything at all. One of the criticisms of the original car was that the exhaust valves only open when the car was in race mode. However, when you do that, you then got no traction control. In dynamic, it will still open above about 4,000 RPM, and then stay open a little bit lower. But these later cars, I suspect, have had their exhausts muted just a little bit because I could hardly hear this thing at all. Alpha took another item out of the Ferrari playbook, which is the little soft suspension button here. They don't call it bumpy road mode. And it means that even over pretty broken tarmac, ride quality is really excellent. On longer journeys too, you can even get about 30 to the gallon, which is not that bad for a car with this kind of performance. You get into a groove with it really quickly. Grip is very impressive for a car with 500 horsepower, 440 pound foot at 600 newton meters, and only rear wheel drive. You can throw this around like a hot hat. In actual fact, on this section of road, I say the dampers are nearly too soft because the car does seem to exhibit a little bit of a lack of control of its body, which is surprising me. That no doubt is a function of the sheer weight this thing is carrying. I do recall at one point Top Gear actually tested one of these versus the new Honda NSX on a wet track and the Alpha was nearly as quick despite having something of a power deficit and rear wheel versus all wheel drive. Well, it was only a couple of days ago that I took a brand new Honda NSX down this road and I've got to say, this is really just as fast. An amazing achievement. Storage in the back is okay. Boot space is actually pretty good. And if you are thinking of buying one of these, there isn't really a lot to choose from between them. The carbon fiber seats apparently are not an actually very desirable option because they look really sexy. But in truth, these comfort seats actually hug you really well. You can also get heating with them, which you can't in the carbons. And that means that apparently most dealers are kind of loath to bring in cars with the carbon seats. That steering doesn't feel quite as hyper as it once did, but I think that's probably because I've been driving quite a few products from Marinello lately, so I've just become somewhat accustomed to it. it does mean though that you can make fairly good progress and until you get into a, a really, really tight bend, you don't have to get too crossed up. So does it still deliver the magic all these years later? Well, I think it does. 
It's an alternative, and the really key thing here that was true when I reviewed it first time round is that this is an Alpha one doesn't have to make excuses for. Most of the Alfa Romeo products from the last sort of two decades have had good things about them. The Brera and 159 are beautiful cars, both outside and in, but the selection of engines was a, a little bit lacklustre and reliability was very, very poor. The later Mitos and Giuliettas, as mentioned, absolutely atrocious inside and very poorly made to boot. With this though, yeah, sure, there will be things that the German equivalents do better. However, there's no real particular area that I feel would be a deal breaker with a Giulia. One of my few issues really with the car is that the Quadrifoglio doesn't look perhaps as visually distinct from the regular car as you might like. You've got those little nostrils in the front, a little vent in the side, different side skirts, different wheel options and a little lip spoiler on the boot. But at a quick glance, it is still just a, a regular Julia. The M3, for example, is far more distinct. Out of this entire package though, it's perhaps the engine which for me is now the weak link. Yes, I know for many it's the superstar, however, it's quite reluctant. It doesn't really like to boost that early. It does take a little while to spin up, and although it has punch, and in fact in the last 1500-2000 RPM is really quite savage, it does feel just, well perhaps, dare I say it, a little ordinary. Maybe I've been spoiled. It doesn't get in the way of your enjoyment for sure, but I did expect a little bit more of it jumping into it after all this time. It's that low down response you really want and it, and it doesn't always have it. The interior is also a touch on the ordinary side and if you're American I can appreciate how you'd be very upset with the fact that you've got a very clearly FCA setup here in the centre screen. Maserati also using the same thing at the moment. But put your foot down, get yourself on a good driving road and these things cease to be issues. The five-year warranty is definitely something that I would want because, unfortunately, some of my experience of Julia's does tell me that these aren't really masses more reliable than the cars which preceded them. And that is a shame. However, I think I would be willing to overlook that just a little bit because these are really rather good. Would I want to pay the near £80,000 Alfa Romeo are now asking for one? No. But the excellent thing there, the changes made really are only minor. Bad news if you want to buy a new one, good news if you want to buy an old one. And if you're thinking about it, do it. Your only barrier really then is dealing with Alfa Romeo's dealer network, who are absolutely awful. One day they'll learn, maybe. But then I guess if they already chucked this in the bin, perhaps not. Either way, I am delighted that within my lifetime we did get an Alfa Romeo truly worthy of the brand's reputation. And at 40 odd thousand quid, if you're looking for an interesting, exciting Petrohead daily, this still is a great option. Thanks today for bringing this out. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.